Okay, so um, let's let's take a look at this. Uh, we we didn't have one like example one uh, from this warm up uh, on the last test, but we will on on our next test next week. Expand and simplify. Okay, so uh, the the easiest way to expand something like this, it's not just like a polynomial times a polynomial, is to rewrite everything uh, that has a radical or a denominator variable, you know, as a, as an exponent. So. That's what I'm going to do first. This becomes 3 times x to the 1 fifth minus 2x to the negative first. And then the second uh, factor is both fine and dandy. Okay. So that would be my first step. And the reason we do that is because when we combine x's, we, we, we've studied, we've practiced the rules of exponents. Yeah. Can you go over one more time how to change the fraction into a fraction? Yeah. Um, this is 2 over x to the first power. So anytime you bring a factor, not a term, from high to low or low to high, all you do is you change the sign of the exponent. So a positive one becomes a negative one. So if I had something like uh, 2 over x cubed, that's equal to 2x um, to the negative third, right? Or if I had 2x to the fifth, and I wanted to bring that to the bottom, that would be 2 over x to the negative fifth. Okay, but it only works with factors. So like if you had two over x cubed plus one, you can't, well, you can't bring that to the top like this. You can't say it's two x to the negative third over one. That doesn't work. What you could do is you could say that the whole thing, because it's more than one term, you could say the whole thing is in the bottom to the first power. And then you could say that would be two times the quantity x cubed plus one and now the whole thing's to the negative first power, okay? So terms don't work as well uh, as factors, but you could term, uh, turn uh, multiple terms into a factor group, okay? All right, so now that we have it all written like this, now we can just FOIL it out. Now, instead of FOILing, because uh, FOIL only works with the, the two, two times two, let's just uh, kind of maybe abandon FOIL and, and just kind of learn how to distribute, okay? I think you'll like this better. So when we have uh, multiple terms times multiple terms, I always like to just start with the first term and the first factor, and you distribute it all the way through. So if I had like three terms in the next factor, I would distribute it to the third term, or four terms, I would keep going all the way through. You're just letting it run its course, right, Brady? You're paying attention? You're always grinning, and I know it's probably math, but there are other things that I know you grin at besides math. So I'm trying to teach you a new way here. So if I distribute, I get 21x to the 1 fifth plus, and then I multiply by the next one, that's 12x to the, and here's our rule, right? 1 fifth plus 2, 2 is how many fifths? Multiply 2 by 5 over 5, and you get 10 fifths, right? So hopefully we are at the point we could do that in our head. 10 fifths plus 1 fifth is... 11 fifths, okay? So that takes care of that. We exhaust the first term all the way through each term in the second factor. Then we switch to the next term and we do the same thing. We distribute it. So we get negative 14 x to the negative first, and now we get negative eight x to the two plus negative one is one. And again, if that second factor had more terms, we would just keep distributing it. If your first factor had another term, then we would just go to the next term and distribute it, see? So FOIL only works with two by two, but distributing in this manner works now with any number of terms times any number of terms. Just start with the first, distribute all the way through. Next term, all the way through. Next term, all the way through. Mas mejor que bueno. Now, do we have any like terms there? Are any of those terms like terms? Beat the bot. They're, they're like terms if they have the same variable type, right? And all the variables are different exponents, right? So none of them are like terms. So the best we could do is just rewrite it back in the original form with radicals and no negative exponents. So that's what we're going to do. 21 times the fifth root of x plus 12 times the fifth root of x to the 11th minus 14 over x to the first minus 8x. And the order in which we write those terms, it doesn't really matter. It's not like a polynomial where we have all nice positive integer exponents and we can write them in descending order. 
So as long as you know that these last two terms are negative, you could shuffle those terms in any order. And if it's an answer choice on the test, I might put them in a different order. So you just need to make sure that you're accounting for each term, like cross out answer choices. It's like, nope, that one has the wrong sign, whatever. <laughs> and do process of elimination. Because it's one thing to get the right answer, right? It's another thing then to correctly identify it from a field of answers. Two different strategies I'm teaching you. All right, any questions on that? I like the split screen, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, iPad has split screen capabilities. So on one screen you can have math, on the other screen you can have your, your uh, psychology uh, or your comic strip or your beat the bot, okay? Any questions on this one? Fun easy, right? It started off being fun, but now it's fun easy. Okay, number two, simplify the complex fraction. How do we know this is a complex fraction? I only see one division bar, the negative exponents. Yeah, very good. So uh, the first step, uh, and again, this is kind of a little crutch. We have four positions, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. So put this whole thing over one, 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 okay? By doing that, you're giving yourself bunk beds, right? And you can now bring things to the bottom bunk because as I just said, you cannot bring terms from high to low, okay? On the main division bar, but I can bring them to the bottom of their own term. So the first step is to get rid of the negative exponents. So that's gonna be seven over X cubed Y to the positive second. There's the new top left position plus two X over Y to the first. That's the new top right position. Everyone good with that? Bottom left, I'm gonna have y squared over x squared. There's a new bottom left position, and then plus two x, I'll just leave it over one. There's no, no negative exponents there. So I could bring factors to the bottom in their own terms. That's what I did. Now we identify the LCM. So if we look at our miniature cute little denominators, you don't have to worry about one. Uh, I need one of each factor type. I'll just extend this out. Uh, so I need an X and I need a Y for sure. I need an X and I need a Y. What's the largest exponent on X? Three, so I need an X cubed. And the largest exponent on Y? Squared, good. So the LCM is X cubed Y squared. Over one, over one. Now again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna distribute. I would like it if you can divide things out in your head in each term, okay? But if you need to just multiply straight across, multiply straight across and then divide out, that seems to help people. Well, let me kind of take you on that little bit of a mental stretch. If I distribute that over here, the X cubed and the Y squared will both divide out, right? This divides out with this, leaving us one in the bottom. That's the goal. When we have ones in the bottom bunks, they go away. So we're left with seven, times one, right? Or just seven? Seven. Plus, <clears throat> when I distribute to the next term, only one Y divides out with one Y up in the top. So that leaves us a two X, it's in the top already, times the X cubed, which is two X to the what? Fourth, I'm gonna write that down because I have a bad short term memory, two X to the fourth. And then what am I left with Y Y's? Just one Y or Y to the first, very good. See, there you go, distribute in your head. All over, now we distribute in the bottom, bless you. We distribute this X squared divides out with the X cubed, bless you, but we're still left with a single X, right? We're left with one X. So I'm gonna write that down because we're left with the Y squared. So I'm left with an X, just one X, and then Y squared times Y squared is Y to the four. You're just taking inventory, right? You'll be well equipped to like work in a warehouse after this year. All right, and then we multiply here and nothing divides out. So we just get two X to the fourth Y squared plus two X to the fourth Y squared. And we're pretty much done because the top doesn't factor. And if the top or the bottom, neither one factors, then nothing is gonna divide out, okay? The bottom just for kicks and giggles, the bottom does factor, so let's just kind of explore that. Uh, right. 
So what can I factor out, Brady, in the bottom? What's the uh, greatest common factor? X and Y squared, good. And when I pull it out front, that leaves me a Y squared in the first term plus a 2X to the cubed, yeah. So that's just another version of the answer. Nothing divides out, but having a factored version of the answer as we move forward and start using this stuff could be useful. It's useful for finding domains of functions, believe it or not, okay? And that's what we're focusing on now because remember, if you can get it factored, you can figure out what causes a zero in the denominator because now that it's factored, you can set them both equal to zero. And we know we can't divide by zero, so those are part of the things we're gonna be looking at when it comes to finding domains, all right? Comments, questions on that? It should be getting fun easy for you. All right, and then number three, huh, my favorite problem. It's P instead of X. So um, some people are still kind of struggling with this, but hopefully you'll practice. It's gonna be on the next test. I'm gonna put those in brackets just for people who are struggling. And then up here we have F of parentheses equals parentheses squared minus five parentheses plus seven. Whatever goes in here goes here and here. This is substitution. So here we go in the top. What is F of X plus P? Let me, let me highlight it in green. F of X plus P is gonna go right here. And we're gonna plug in for the parentheses, we're gonna plug in X plus P here and here. So we get quantity X plus P squared minus five times x plus p plus seven, boom, okay? See how it's color coordinated? And then this is here. And then minus parentheses, f of x itself. So x squared minus five x, beat the bot, plus seven, all over p, okay? This is super important to, to check at this point and make sure you have your x plus p twice because Here's what a lot of people want to do. I'm still seeing it on a few papers. They, they think f of x plus p is x squared minus 5x plus 7 plus p, and it's not, okay? You don't just add a p at the end. What this is equal to is f of x, close parentheses, pause, pause, plus p, adding p as an afterthought. That's not what we're doing. We are substituting it in, okay? Now that we have it all set up, now we can expand it. So X plus P quantity squared, remember, what's the ditty? Besides beat the bot, beat the bot, oh yeah, beat the bot. How do we square a binomial? Square, multiply double, square, there you go. Square, multiply double, square, square, multiply double, square. So you get X squared as the first term, multiply XP, double and get two XP. There's nothing to distribute. And then you square the last, P squared. Some people are still forgetting that there's a middle term. If you're calling that X squared plus P squared, if you're calling that X squared plus P squared, you need to go all the way back, all the way back. Oh no, all the way back, really? All the way back. Where? All the way back to 1.1. All the way back to 1.1. Remember example five? We had a counter example that proved that A plus B quantity squared was not A squared plus B squared because 64 doesn't equal 50, remember? So it is equal to A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. So yeah, don't, don't be making those mistakes this late in the game, right? All right, so whoa, that's not what we wanted. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, there we go, I'm getting ahead of myself. So there we go, square, multiply double, square, or foil it off to the side. And now we distribute, we get minus, whoa, I'm writing with a highlighter, minus five X, minus five P, plus seven. So that takes care of expanding this thing right here. And now it's minus X squared, plus five X, minus seven. Some people are still forgetting to take care of that negative. I don't care how you take care of the negative. You put brackets or parentheses there on the setup and then on the next line you distribute it and change all the signs. There are a few people that are going straight to changing all the signs in that second term. One person on the test even put an arrow there and put change all signs. And I'm like, yes, way to communicate, all right? 
And then it's all over P. You certainly don't want to lose a check by forgetting to put it over P, do you? No. All right, now here's your checkpoint. Make sure it works. And I'm going to borrow, uh, bless you, I think Giovanni, I saw this first on Giovanni, using a highlighter to divide them out. You can't do it on the test, right? You just draw a real thin line through it. But uh, for, for notability, it works great. Make sure things cancel that don't have a P. They should cancel. X squared minus X squared, they're gone. Negative 5X and plus 5X, right? Don't just force them to be zero. If you forgot to distribute, that's still going to be a negative, and you're going to have a negative 10X. And you're like, oh, crap, that doesn't have a P. I forgot to distribute. Um, and then plus 7 minus 7, same thing. If you don't distribute the negative, you're going to get plus 14 instead of zero. Now, here's where you don't want to make a mistake. There are three terms left. One term, two terms, three terms. So we're going to have three terms left. If you want to factor it out on the next line, that's fine. Some people like to write an extra step here as a cleanup step, which I'm fine with that, right? Careful inventory is a lot of times what it's all about. You got to be organized. So with those three terms, um, now we got to do is factor out a P. Now, some people are going straight from here to this line, 2X plus P minus 5. If you've ever done that, I have always inserted an arrow here, and I have said, show the factor out step. So here it is. It's on video. I'm telling everybody here. If you're not here. You're watching the video. No excuses. I will count off on the next test if I don't see the factor out step. So P parentheses, 2X plus P minus 5 all over P. And then it's kind of like it, it's worth it because now you can celebrate. You can divide out the P's and you can make that fun sound, right? You're celebrating. And then at the end, these terms can be in any order, okay? Sometimes they get arranged in a different order. But that's fine. Negative 5 plus P plus 2X, that works equally well. So make sure you show this factor out step. The reason I want you to show this factor out step is it reinforces that you can divide out factors, plus it, 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 it helps with careless mistakes, and it looks better. When you go from here to here, a lot of people like scratch things out, and that's not good because it doesn't communicate. There's three terms, so it's worth doing. Now, if you ever had something like six-fourths, you can go straight to three halves, right? You, you don't have to show that factor out step, right? That would be two times three over two times two, which is three halves. I don't make you show it on something like that, but that's just one number, okay? I would expect you to be able to do that, okay? But if there's more than one term and we're talking about variables, show the step, show the step. It's for your own benefit. It looks better, you avoid careless mistakes. Now, don't do this. Here's one last thing I saw like on three papers. They know that they have to factor out the P and so on this top step here, they do this, and they put an extra P there, right? That's not, and then they go straight from there to there. You have an extra P when you do that. That's not how you factor something out. You have to take what's already there and pull it out, right? So when you write it, um, you don't have this P that's still in there. You have no P, no P, no P, right? Which when you have animals in the house, that's a good thing, right? Because otherwise you're left trying to get the pee out, right? And that's carpet stains with pet stains. Yeah. Bad. Right. Stay. Change. Don't pee on the carpet anymore. And flip. Right. Dogs. I love dogs. Who doesn't love dogs? I love dogs almost as much as I hate bots. Yeah. All right. I have three dogs. Okay. Um, any questions on the warm-up? Are we warm? How are we doing on time? We got 10 minutes. All right. Okay, so, well, that's fine. It's, it's a good warm-up. It'll be on the next test, so it's worth doing. As we learn stuff, you try not to forget it as we move forward. Because, you know, with math, everything is, is it's lattice work. We build upon previous things. They call that scaffolding, right? It's not like you can just forget about, uh, you know, the War of 1812 because uh, we're focusing on uh, 1815 now, right? Whatever. I don't know how history classes work. Um, notes, 2.1. So we got through, we got through example two yesterday, the vertical line test, VLT, right? Okay, so now we're on uh, beat the bot. Example three, 
Now we're going to look at equations in terms of x and y, and we're going to discover if they are, in fact, functions of x. All right? And if not, we're going to explain why. So here we go. The first one. We have an equation. y squared plus 3x equals 6. Is this equation a function of x? That is, if we were to somehow generate its graph, would it pass the vertical line test? Is there um, a adherence to the rule that for every input, there could be no more than one output? What do y'all think? You're going to just, yes, because y'all are optimistic and hopeful. All right. Well, here, here's kind of like the ultimate litmus test. If you can solve it for y as a single function of x, solve for y as a single function of x. One equation as a single function of x. That's the goal. Can we solve it for y equals and then have nothing on the other side except x's and have just a single equation. That's the ultimate litmus test. So if it's not solved for y, that's your first attempt algebraically. Let's solve it for y, OK? So uh, I need to get the 3x to the other side. So it's going to be 6 minus 3x. Perfect. Now, to solve for y, how do I undo squaring something? I root it. But I have to remember. To never forget, not just 9-11, that, that's still weighing on me from the other day, the 20th anniversary, oh my gosh. But also, we can't forget when we take a square root or a fourth root or a sixth root to consider on the other side, what? I left space. Talk to me. Well, the equal sign's there. How about this? What's the square root of 25? Kind of. What that another way to phrase that? What number when you square it gives you 25? Five. Or five again. <laughs> There's another number that when you square it gives you 25 other than five. Negative five. Negative five. Yeah. Because negative times a negative is a positive. So what's the square root of 25? Not just five, but Negative five. When you take a square root or a fourth root or an even root, you have to remember to not forget to put plus or minus in front. Now, that doesn't work with cube roots. The cube root of eight is just two, not negative two also, because negative two cubed is negative eight. But even roots plus or minus. If you forget, you're missing half the solution. Now, I did solve it for y as a function of x. See that y equals and there's nothing but x's on the other side. No y's. But did I do it for a single equation? Not if I remember plus or minus. How many equations does it take? Two. Two. OK? Two equations. And if you remember what the negative does in front, it kind of flips the graph across the x-axis. So I'm not going to get into what this looks like uh, in great detail, but this is what this one looks like. And if you reflect that across the x-axis, which is what the negative in front does, it's an x-axis reflection, it's going to look like this. So that whole thing becomes the new graph of the equation. Does that graph pass the vertical line test? No. Okay. Because we have one that's plus, and then the negative in front reflects it. So anytime you take a square root of something to solve for y or the fourth root of something, it's not going to be a function of x. So, so this would be like no, right? Not a function of x. Y cannot solve, cannot solve for y as a single function of x. And I know that that's crazy writing. I'm trying to stay organized, but I'm running out of room down here. Okay. So we have all the math work and there's my summary, you know. No, it's not a function of x. It's still an equation, just not a function of x. Now, 
Is there a way that we could have determined that before we solve for Y? What do you notice about the exponent on the Y? It's two, right? That was the culprit that gave us plus or minus. The exponent on the Y, this is important. The exponent on the Y tells you how many Y's you're gonna have for each value of X. For each value of X. So immediately if you see Y squared, you're like, oh, there are some X values that have how many Y values? Two. Is that okay for a function? No, no, it's not. So that is a giveaway right there. Now you can verify it by trying to solve. That's the ultimate litmus test, as I said. But let's just state this and we'll be done for the day. And, you know, we'll continue to beat the bot all day long. The exponent on the Y tells you how many uh, y values you have for each x. Okay, so here's kind of a rule. Y to the n to be a function of x, comma, n has to be less than or equal to what number? One, very good. My work is done for today. That's, that's it. If you understand that and that alone, that was a good day in a math class, okay? Because we understand functions and we can now spot them at a glance like we can spot bots on the internet. Slow and steady increases even during the midnight hours when we, lugu, 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 the bots lugubriate. Lugubriate, remember? Was that the word that means toil? I forgot. Yeah, I work tirelessly burning the midnight oil. Those bots work lucubriously. All right, let's let's uh let's call it a day, and uh, I'll see you again tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll have one more beat the bot warm up, um, and we'll surge ahead. It closes tomorrow at 7 p.m. But uh, be working on um, be working on section 2.1. I think there's probably a lot of it on there that you could do, but maybe still a lot that you can't do because we haven't really gotten into yet algebraically finding domains, but we're paving a very solid foundation. Yes, cool. We're up by more than eight. We are? Sweet. Let's keep distancing ourselves. All right. Have a super duper awesome, wonderful, fantastic day.